Hello, and welcome to the Sailing and Cruising, the East Coast of the United States podcast. I'm Bela Musitz. And I'm Mike Wasserman. Hey, Mike, before we dive into this podcast, we need to say a special thank you to our newest Patreon supporter, Mike. Hey, Mike, the other Mike, not you, not but me. The Mike, that's the supporter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Thank you for your support of the Sailing and Cruising the East podcast. It is really appreciated. If you'd like to support the podcast, it's really easy via Patreon. Just go to patreon.com forward slash sailing the east. Also, the podcast is now available on YouTube as well as your favorite podcasting app. Today's guest for the podcast is Tim Geisler from Nautilus Sailing. He founded and runs a business where guests can learn to sail in a week, receive their American Sailing Association certifications, and all of this happens at wonderful destinations around the world. It's a really different concept when it comes to sailing schools. And Bela, I'm especially interested in this one because I guess I'm part of the target market, right? People who don't have a lot of sailing experience but are interested. And, you know, it, this kind of also combines two of our shared interests in entrepreneurship and sailing. Um, so I'm really interested to hear kind of the innovations that Tim has developed and how this shakes out in a, in a you know, in a crowded market, right, with lots of m kind of mature competitors in, in the space. So right. I, I think let's jump right in and give it a listen. Yeah. Yep. Sounds good. Hey, Tim, how are you? Good. How are you, Bella? Yeah, nice to meet you here. So let me ask you a question. If you're at a social event, so a, a non-work related social event, so a social event that has nothing to do with sailing and you <laughs> okay. get introduced to somebody and after that introduction, they ask you this question, Tim, really nice to meet you. What do you do? How do you answer that question? Oh, that's an interesting one, Bella. Uh, I've thought about it in a couple different ways and at different times I've answered in different ways. Um, one of the ones that I've enjoyed telling people is I'll say, um, my job is to help people um, live their sailing dreams. And inevitably that leads to other conversations where people say, what exactly does that mean? And then I can go into, well, actually I help people learn how to sail um, so that they can set off and cruise around the world or, you know, charter boats and fulfill their sailing dreams. Yeah. Oh, great. That's a good answer. So tell us a little bit about uh, uh, your, your sailing business, uh, its name, what it does. Uh, give us a little background. Perfect. So um, we started Nautilus Sailing about 13 years ago, and it was born just out of a desire to have a sailing school that was a little bit different. I learned how to sail about 25 years ago in Southern California, and I had eight different sailing instructors, and they were all accomplished, amazing sailors, Bella, but really none of them knew how to teach. And so teaching was kind of a lot of yelling and don't touch that. Mm. And, what are you doing? And so I, I, I really, I, I struggled with some of the learning. And at the time I happened to be a, an elementary school teacher in inner city, Los Angeles. And I was actually considered what they called a master teacher. So I would train new teachers. Um, I was in charge of developing some experimental education programs and quickly realized, wow, there's so much potential here, but no one is really using, you know, best educational practices to teach people how to sail. And so yeah. I went away, had many years in the corporate world, did international project management and all that. And in 2008, when the economy crashed, we had a chance to reinvent ourselves. And my wife and I loved sailing. And at the time we said, well, why don't we merge some of our passions? You know, we sail in our free time. We love teaching as well. So why don't we kind of merge those? And so out of that, Nautilus was born. Oh, excellent. Excellent. So how many years ago was that, please? I that was uh, coming up on 13 years, actually 13 years next month. Right, right. And so uh, you said to make it different. So certainly one aspect of this is is having teaching skills. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Being a professional teacher, understanding the different ways people learn. Some people learn by hearing, right? Some people learn exactly. by doing. <laughs> Other yep. people learn by by reading. So you have to combine all of those types of things. Uh, but what else, what else is sort of unique about what you do? Yeah, good question. So the other unique side about thing, 
about things. I learned in Southern California, Newport Beach. It was fantastic, beautiful place. Uh, but I would go every Sunday, Bella, for about two hours, three hours. We would undo the boat, get the fenders, you know, tie up the jib, get the jib sheets out. We'd motor the 30 minutes out. We'd go sail for an hour and then we'd come all the way back in. We'd spray off the boat, hang everything up and go home. And I did that for about a year and a half um, to get my ASA 101, 103 and 104 certs. And the goal was always I wanted to go charter. Um, I kind of my big dream was I think I want to sail yeah. the South Pacific. And so, you know, this this worked for me at the time. It was the only way to learn how to sail. And we realized um, when we started Nautilus, we had moved to a little ski town in Colorado. And we realized, what about all the folks that don't live near the ocean that can't afford to go every Sunday, right, to learn how to sail? What happens to somebody from Colorado or Wyoming or Montana or place like that that only has maybe a week or so? So when we started Nautilus, there was just these liveaboard sailing courses were just starting to gain popularity. And so schools yeah. like Colgate Offshore, Stephen Doris Colgate, they were kind of pioneering them. And so we thought, hey, let's do this. Let's us let's focus our courses on an intensive immersion course. And rather than learning in a coastal area, let's take people to these cruising destinations. We'll expose them to sailing, give an immersive in-depth course in a week's time. And so that was kind of, you know, the other impetus behind starting Nautilus. The one side was the educational background and the other was, hey, can we do it in an intensive course in a week? Right. Right. And and you're also, uh, if I if I remember correctly, uh, an American Sailing Association uh, affiliated, I don't know what the right word is, school, so that when I'm done with that week, I have a certificate, assuming I pass, I have a certificate that I can take and then charter a boat that's accepted with most charter companies. Exactly. Yep. And so the American Sailing Association, they are actually the largest sailing certification entity in the world. You know, there's lots of others, the RYA in England, the CYA yes. in Canada, the FFV in France. But the American Sailing Association is huge. It's globally recognized. And so from the beginning, we realized, Bella, we want to do this properly. We want to give people formal certs that are going to be recognized anywhere they go and give them the tools. So, yeah, from the beginning, we've been an official American Sailing Association school. Yeah. Well, I, I will tell you that both my wife and I took a, a week long course, right? A live aboard course yeah. uh, on the Chesapeake Bay. And cool. we got one ASA 101, 102 and 104 okay. in a week. And and we were sort of experienced sailors. So we had yeah. sailed a, a small Catalina 22 for 20, yep. 30 years on inland lakes. Yep. And uh, that to get those three certifications in in, you know, five days in a week, uh, that that was a pretty rigorous, pretty full day. Right? Yes, I mean it was wonderful. I'm, that's that's not a complaint. It's just an yeah. observation that it's, you know, we weren't sitting around drinking pina coladas for half the day. <laughs> exactly. Right? So you have to have the right mindset if you're going to knock this off in a week. That, you know, yeah. I'm I'm going to school. It, you know, and it's really key. And that's one of the things our office staff, when people call in, they're like, well, how much time am I going to have to work on my tan? No, I mean, like you say, we are busy from eight in the morning till four or so in the afternoon. We're going, we're sailing between islands. It's new skills, you know, engines, right. checklists, navigating. There's a lot of material to cover. We have, uh, it's just over a hundred practical skills that we have to cover with right. every single student. So to get a hundred practical skills in into a week, you've got to be going, right? Like you say, there may be a pina colada at the end of the day, but you're going to work hard and you're going to earn that pina colada. Right. So these liveaboard courses, a lot of it is the preparation ahead of time. People have to do the work ahead of time. They've got to read their books. We send out a bunch of videos to help with all the skills um, ahead as well. But really, it takes a certain kind of person, right? This is yeah. it's a lot of info. Yeah. And and not only are those practical skills, it, it, I took mine probably 15 years ago now. There was a, at least two, maybe three written exams as well. It's, yeah, I mean, for us, it's, you know, it's it's three for the 104. It's three 100 question multiple choice tests. And a lot of our students are actually getting their catamaran certification as well. So that's another fourth test. So there's there's a lot yeah. of information. Yeah, I, I do want to get into the mono hull catamaran thing uh, a little bit later, but I had a few more questions. So who's who's your ideal student or let me let me rephrase that. Uh, if I'm listening to this podcast and I've never sailed before, is this something I should consider or is this more for someone who maybe has gone out, you know, has some basic sort of skills? Great question. So 
most of our students, I'd say probably 98% of our students are coming into our courses having no sailing experience except, hey, maybe I sailed on my cousin Bob's Hobie cat once and flipped it over when I was right. 14. And so really we're getting more and more people that have not sailed and they want to test the waters. They want to see if cruising is for them. They want to see if sailing is for them. And they're just excited about it. And I think a lot of that, Bella, probably has to do with just the popularity of sailing video blogs. I think there's just way more yeah. awareness just about the yeah. sailing lifestyle. And so, yeah, most of our students come into these courses not knowing things. And, you know, people will say, hey, I haven't been sailing for 20 years. Can I do your course? The answer is definitely, as long as you're willing to put in the time, study in advance and, you know, dive in on the boat, you'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. So let, let me, let me ask you a couple of ent entrepreneurial questions. Cause, cause I actually do two podcasts. I, I, I do this sailing podcast and I also do another podcast about entrepreneurship and small businesses. Okay. Yeah. So the, my, my first question is how the heck do you run a sailing school from Colorado? <laughs> Right. Which for, for those international listeners not familiar with the United States is is is, you know, at least, I don't know, five, six hundred miles away from an ocean, if not further. Uh, it's a really good question. We get that a lot. It's like, is, are you guys for real? You're in the middle of the mountains. We're in a little ski town at nine thousand feet. Um, and so people are like, is this, is this legit? And so I think when we first started Nautilus, um, we were actually, my wife and I were avid scuba divers as well. And what was crazy is we found out one of the largest scuba diving clubs in the, in the country in North America is based out of Denver. And so what do they do? They load up these planes with 300 scuba divers and they're going to the Caribbean to dive every other month. Mm -hmm. And so crazy to think that one of the largest scuba diving clubs in the country is in Colorado. And so we thought, you know what? Coloradans are adventurous. Let's um, get some of these folks that they ski, you know, they do whatever, all these different activities. Let's get them introduced to sailing. So when we first started, we thought the appeal was going to be for Colorado. And we put up the website, put it up online. And then all of a sudden we started finding people coming from San Francisco and California. Sure. And, you know, really the web has no boundaries. And then what's crazy now, Bella, is 30% of our clients are Canadians, right? So the Canadians, it's like hey, they want to escape and get away in the middle of the winter. So we've got a lot of Canadians. And so the amazing thing about the Internet is you can really be based out of anywhere. So we have a small office, couple of office staff that handle all the bookings and reservations and all that yeah. thing. But actually, our instructors are all over the country, and we fly our instructors in for our courses to make sure that everyone's getting just an amazing quality instructor for their trip. Right, right. I mean, I, I, you know, most of the sailing schools I'm familiar with are sort of based at a marina. Yeah. And, you know, they have a couple of boats there that maybe they use for this, and, and the instructors are usually from the region. Yeah. Uh, now, now you take a different approach, right? I mean, not only are you based in, in inland in Colorado, but you're sort of a destination sailing school. Yes, exactly. And so part of it, there was, you know, we've seen these sailing schools where, you know, they own one sailing boat and it's a 40 foot monohull and it's 34 years old, right? And you just think that's great, but we really wanted to offer our clients. We figured, hey, if our clients are flying halfway around the world, you know, they're maybe they're going to our destination in Tahiti, or maybe they're going to Mexico or the Grenadines or Croatia to learn to sail with us. We want to give them the best experience possible. So part of our program is we rent boats from Dream Yacht Charters, and we rent the newest boats in production. So the newest catamarans in the market, the newest monoholes, so that people get a chance to experience these beautiful boats. And what's interesting is uh, back in 2019, we were renting so many boats with Dream Yacht Charters. Dream Yacht Charters, which is the largest charter company in the world. Yes. They have about 1,100 boats in 54 countries, I believe. Um, they basically approached us and said, hey, Nautilus, you guys do an amazing job. We love how your students are, are coming to us so prepared and doing such a great job of chartering would you be the official sailing school for dream yacht charters so we are actually the official sailing school now for dream yacht charters globally oh, wow. as well yeah oh that's a great great endorsement so where where are your destinations can you can you uh, take yeah. us through those so the first one is mexico and we sail out of the city of la paz which is just up around the corner from cabo I grew, I was spent a lot of time in California, Bella, never even knew this part of the world existed, even though it's just south of California. And the Sea of Cortez has 972 islands and it's just stunning, right? So that was our first destination. We also um, sail in the Grenadines, the southern part of the Caribbean. And 
part of it for us has always been, Bella, we want to do destinations that are a little off the beaten track. We don't want to open up a sailing school in Tampa or Los Angeles or San Diego, right? We want an exotic cruising destination. So we do the Grenadines. We also do the Exumas in the Bahamas. Um, and then Tahiti is kind of our premier, premium, off the charts, gorgeous location. A little harder to get to and more expensive, but amazing. And then in Europe, we now have bases in Mallorca, Spain and Croatia. So six bases that we have right now. Oh, wow. Wow. That sounds really nice. So uh, these are sort of, uh, if, I'm a, if I'm a potential customer, I'm looking at uh, traveling someplace, obviously. I'm not just driving down to my local marina. Um, so I, I'm. It, for me, it's going to be, I, I can imagine it's a vacation slash, you know, week of intensive course. So maybe Maybe I should go for two weeks, <laughs> right? Get there a couple of days early, get acclimated, you yes. know, kind of figure out which way's up and down, and then stay a few extra days on the back end. Is that is that typical of sort of what happens? It really is. Most people do that. We're finding that more and more of our students either work from home, they're their own, they own their own businesses and things like that. So they have a little bit more flexible time. And so most are kind of combining it with a week of intensive and then a week of fun, especially like when they fly all the way to Europe, right. to Spain, you know, why not go to Spain for a week, learn how to sail with us and then spend another week exploring Spain or Portugal. Right. Now, is it, is your offering these one week intensive courses or do you also offer it in bits and bytes? No. So because of the just the way the charter boats work, they really they can only charter boats to you for five or seven days. You can't rent a charter boat for you know two days to do a weekend right. course. So we really right. focus on a full weekend Super. package. We occasionally get people saying, hey, I already have my 101, 103. Can I get my 104 just in two days with you? We don't have that facility because we're renting big boats. So we get those folks off and they'll come back in. It's a review during the week. They already know their 101, sure. 103. And then they can move straight on to the 104. So that's kind of how we do that. Right. Um, excellent. So where do you find your instructors, right? Because you're doing this all around the world. Honestly, that has been one of the challenges. And it's been amazing, Bella, because we've we haven't we've never advertised for our instructors. It's always through word of mouth through our network, because the biggest thing we want is we want instructors that are not just amazing sailors, but incredible teachers. And that sure. is very, very hard to find. Um, and so we do that through word of mouth and then through interviewing people and really just checking more their teaching skills and their sailing background, right? Really for us, the essence is how are they going to be with people? You know, how are they going to present information and, you know, respond to varying learning styles? And, you know, when you've got four people on a boat, take a maximum of four, what if you have one guy who's been sailing for 20 years and then you have someone else who's never set foot on a boat? You know, how are right. you catering the, you know, the educational um, approach to everyone? So we really have to find people that are good teachers and so you know right now we've got an, uh, a staff of 11 instructors that are scattered around north america and we fly them in and all of them are they're all in the top one percent of asa instructors so at the end of everyone's courses they do an, an anonymous review online every single one of our instructors is in the top one percent and usually we have a couple instructors that win what they call the asa outstanding instructor award every year and that's the top 20 out of 3,000 instructors worldwide oh, wow so, Again, we're wow. going for instructors that are teachers first and foremost, and you know, then have sailing experience. Yeah, yeah. And and let, let's say I wanted to be an instructor. Is there a sort of I'll use the word apprenticeship program you sort of put me through? Right? Do I am I the fifth wheel on a boat for you know a couple of weeks just to kind of see how how it all works within within the scope of what you guys do? Good question. So we're hoping that most most of our instructors come into us with already a wealth of sailing experience internationally. Sure. So most of our instructors have either their yacht master offshore or their U.S. Coast Guard, and they've worked in the industry chartering and you know doing all that kind of stuff and have some delivery experience, all that. And then um, when they come into us, we do we spend basically they'll they'll everyone every instructor will spend a week with me shadowing me and during that time i'm hitting the educational techniques of hey this is how we teach us did you notice or are they responding not responding and so they already have the sailing side down but it's more how we teach these things what's the easiest way to teach anchoring to people who have never anchored how do you teach right. reefing systems to people who don't know what a reef is right and so i'm able to model it and then what we do is we check up and i follow up with instructors to see how they're doing um, but that's it there's no there's no long apprenticeship program it's usually just an intensive week shadowing me on a course Oh, very nice. Very nice. So let's talk a little bit about uh, catamarans and monohulls. 
right? Uh, I know the school at the marina where my boat is just has mono hulls. Uh, the school that we took our lessons at was just mono hulls. So uh, maybe first talk a little bit about the differences between sailing a mono hull and a catamaran. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is this is a massive subject, right? As I'm sure you're aware. The big difference between a mono hole, you have one single hole. Uh, mono holes have deep um, keels. So what's neat is they point really well into the wind. You get this healing effect. It feels amazing sailing on a mono hole, right? You get the experience. You feel like you're there. The sensation of sailing is beautiful. I love mono holes for that reason. The downside of a mono hole is you're going down into the hole. It's more confined. There's not as much light. Um, the boat rocks more at anchorage. It's not as spacious. A catamaran, on the other hand, has two holes and shallower keels. So you end up with kind of this platform above, tons of light, tons of space, much more areas to hang out. You know, you're kind of, it's like a, a high-end New York loft where you have glass all yes. the way around. Whoever's cooking can see everything. There's a breeze. It's like an open floor living plan. I mean, it's, it's very different. Now, the way catamarans sail, they sail very well um, as you fall off the wind. They don't do so well into the wind because they have short keels, but as you fall off the wind and get down to a beam reach and a broad reach, they're actually faster than monoholes, but you don't get the healing sensation. That's good for some people, not as good for others. Um, one thing that we've seen, Bella, when we started, all we did was monohull courses, and that's yeah. what we did around the world. And we have seen that completely flip-flop in the last five years. And so now I would say almost 90% of our courses are on catamarans. And if you go to any charter company around the world, like we, we sail out of the Exumas in the Bahamas and Dream Yacht Charters has 76 boats in their fleet there, four are monoholes and 72 yeah. catamarans, right? And so yeah. we've seen the shift where it used to be charter companies had a few catamarans and lots of monoholes. And that is completely flip-flopped in most charter companies. Same thing, you know, I'm in La Paz, Mexico right now, about to do a trip here. And the marina here, I think they've got 24 boats, and I think they've got like six monoholes, you know, and the rest are catamarans. So there's been this massive shift towards catamarans. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing how how quickly that shift has taken place, right? If you look at any yes. industry, I mean, catamarans have been around for a long time. It's, it's, yeah. it's not like it's a new invention, <laughs> right? No. right? And then it just seems like maybe the advent of YouTube and w whatever. And, and look, from the point of view of if you're not a diehard sailor, you know, traditionalist, and, and you're not on a wooden, you know, mahogany boat, catam you're right, catamarans have just great space. And it's just perfect for sort of, uh, you know, two families or two couples or four couples, whatever. You sort of get your own space. You can be away from each other. <laughs> And and you still have the nice common area, and you said it's nice and flat, it's stable, it doesn't heal. It's just wonderful. It is. And I think, I mean, that's I, probably part of the reason just for the growth in sailing and seeing so many cruisers out there in the, in, on the water is the fact that catamarans have all these amenities, right? I yeah. mean, you've got a multiple fridges, all these different things. you got water makers and more room for all these kind of systems. And so I think we're getting people on the water that are like, yeah, I didn't want to be in a 30-foot monohole sailing around the world, but I could do a 45-foot catamaran where I've got a big bed and all this and air conditioning right. at the dock. And so it, it's definitely, you're right, for the diehard sailors, monoholes are a blast. I still love sailing them, but catamarans hard to beat just the amenities and the comfort yeah you know one of the things that i think youtube has really done with all the sailing channels is they have shown that yes indeed you can sail around the world on a catamaran and yes indeed you can sail around the world on a production sailboat right yeah. uh, where, where you know 20 years ago it was well you have to have a blue water full keel <laughs> boat and it has to be this <laughs> way and if it's not one of these three brands you're putting your life in danger. And okay. YouTube has really sort of taken that and demonstrated that, yes, indeed, two people who've never sailed before in their lives <laughs> yeah. can get some education. And lo yeah. and behold, they can take a production catamaran or a production sail, but monohull and take it around the world. Yeah. And I mean, it is amazing. We're getting more and more clients too, Bella, who you know, they may not want to sail completely around the world, but we're getting families sure. like, hey, you know what? Let's take a sabbatical. We're going to rent out our house and we're going to spend one year sailing around the Caribbean. And for a family, right. why not? I mean, the Caribbean, how hard of a cruising ground is it? As long as you watch the weather and things, it's okay. You can have right. a blast. And so it is neat, like you say, to see that people have realized, hey, you don't have to have the crazy offshore blue water sailing boat and be able to round Cape Horn, right? Go go sail the right. Caribbean for a year. Right. Now, again, being a monohull person, 
what what are some other differences? Are there differences in, yeah. in, in you know, when I reef? Are there differences in anchoring? Are there differences in docking, et cetera? Take me through a couple of those things, just for yeah. our listeners, right, who may be thinking about this. Yeah, so really good point. So the main things in terms of sailing is when you tack a catamaran, it's very different from a monohull because we have a massive mainsail and usually we have a smaller foresail. It's usually the opposite on a monohull, right? You may have a big 135 Genoa and a smaller mainsail. Right. But on a cat, what that means is when we tack, rather than a quick tack through the wind, we have to do kind of an arc to keep up our speed. And the biggest thing that gets new catamaran sailors is we have this effect called wind veining, where the massive mainsail acts as a wind vein. And as you come through your tack, that mainsail pulls you back into the wind. So new catamaran sailors often will get partway through and like, uh, why is the boat being pulled all the way back into the wind? And it's the effect of wind veining. So there's a couple things you can do with wind veining, but that's one thing that you'll notice difference on tacks. Jiving, it's a little different. Usually you're going downwind, you're going almost as fast as the speed in the wind of, on some cats. So you don't have to have the same kind of attention that you need on a monohull. A lot easier to jive a cat. Um, and then in terms of just even maneuvering and things, catamarans, even though they're big, much more take up a lot of room, visibility is not as good, more freeboard. Because you have dual throttles, the control yeah, yeah. is just amazing, right? So people are always a little intimidated, like how am I gonna pick up a mooring ball with a 45 foot catamaran? Really, you have the surgical precision when you have dual helms. And so teaching people the mooring and the docking, it's actually way easier than trying to dock a 40 foot monohull, you know, where, where you're coming in sure. and trying to use, you know, the wind and the, the prop walk and all that. So I think those are probably some of the key differences. At anchor and at mooring, it's very similar. It's just, you know, we have a bridle system because we have two holes you have to center the yep. weight of either the anchor or the mooring ball and so you know we use a bridle system but apart from that it's a it's pretty similar yeah yeah that's great that's great uh are there are there other uh things that uh let me just take a step back to the course so i'm listening to this i'm thinking hey i i'd like to go to spain i've never been there before uh take me through you know i call your office Take me through the process of getting me to Spain. Okay. <laughs> so um, initially, you know, when you call in, like we kind of said earlier, we really want to make sure that expectations are clear for mm. everybody. So yes. early on, we had a couple of folks show up like, okay, I'm going to be suntanning on the bow of the boat six hours a day and I want my certs. And it's like, it doesn't quite work that way, right? So usually the office staff is just talking about, hey, they're going to ask, what's your sailing experience? What are your sailing goals and dreams? What do you want out of this? Do you want a charter? Do you want to own your own boat? How does that look? So we really want to make sure that we're getting clients that know that this is an intensive learning course and experience. So that's the first stage. And then when someone signs up, Usually they put a 50% deposit down. And then at that point we send them their textbooks and that's either three or four textbooks, right. depending on whether they're doing the monohull or the catamaran course. And then we say, start studying. We send them some videos we've created that cover all the major things from anchoring to docking. So they can also see it in a visual form. And we want them to study and prepare. Then they come to the course and when they get on the boat, basically the first couple days, it really is like drinking from a fire hydrant, Bella. And we warn people like you are going to get this immersion and just new terminology and new language and all these things. And often, you know, at the end of the first or second day, people have this kind of glazed deer in the headlight look where they're just like, what have I gotten myself into? But what we love is being able to hit everything really hard from the systems and how do you, you know, do your charter briefing and all that to learning to navigate and check your engines and to sail and reef and more and all that. And then usually by about day three, the instructor is stepping back and people are having the chance to be more and more autonomous. And each day we have what's called a captain for the day. So every student gets to be the captain for the day. They're directing everything, mm. bring the boat in and out because eventually they will be captains. And so for us, I love that midpoint transition where all of a sudden it is clicking. And on day three or four, usually we, we assign students a task like, okay, there's an island over there. It's an hour away. You guys are going to sail there. You're going to circumnavigate it. You're going to pick your anchorage. You're going to drop the anchor. You're going to do all that. And they're doing everything on their own. And then the last couple of days, they're pretty much on their own. We're just kind of keeping a... a a watchful eye on them so that they're really practicing the skills. So our goal is by the end of the week, we want them feeling comfortable with all the basic operations of a catamaran. Are they going to be an expert? No, no one's an expert after a week, right? But we want to give, have given them the tools so that they can safely embark on their own sailing adventure, go charter a boat, sail with friends. And again, they're not going to be experts, but they're going to have a license to learn and they'll be able to successfully start on their own. Right. 
And are, are these five day or seven day courses? Seven days, seven full seven days. days. Oh, yep. okay. Very yep. good. Yeah. And, the know, one I took was five days. So you're putting two extra days in there, which I think is good. It is. And, you know, part of it too is, again, it's an intensive course, but usually we try to be done by like three, four in the afternoon. And then part of it is we want to expose people, Bella, to the cruising lifestyle. So, hey, let's go yeah. to that bar over there and have a drink or, hey, there's an amazing snorkeling spot over here. Let's go check that out. Or we got to go paddleboard into this lagoon. And so we're trying to give people a taste. So there is a bit of experiencing the local culture, getting to see what the cruising lifestyle is all about. Because at the end of the day, we want to get people excited and fired up and we want them to enjoy sailing. Right. You know, and, and I really, uh, we chartered for about 15 years be before we kind of pulled the trigger and bought a big boat. And I, I think chartering is such a great way of sort of doing this. Right. And, yeah. and it may feel expensive, but it's way cheaper than owning your own boat. <laughs> it is. <laughs> right? I mean, way cheaper. So yeah. if, if you're going to go sailing for, you know, three or four weeks a year, you know, meaning a week here or three or four days here and then another chartering is so great you can check out different destinations um and you know and particularly with a catamaran because you know keeping a catamaran I, at least i know comp so i have a 45 foot boat right so it's a, okay. it's a big boat yeah and and but a catamaran is twice as expensive to keep it to marina because you're taking up two slips it's twice right. as wide and it's twice as exp if you have to haul it like where i am in the northeast the boats come out in the wintertime. It's twice as expensive to keep it yeah. for winter storage. So basically, and it's got two motors. So maintenance is twice as expensive, yeah. right? Yeah. So it, it really, it, it, it's really much more expensive. So from the point of view of sort of getting your ticket punched, i.e. I can walk into a place, I can charter a, a catamaran, I can take it for a week in June, I can take it for another week in July and a week in August and everyone's happy. It's such a great way of doing it. It really is. It, it is, you know, and I think a lot of people don't realize that, right? They want the boat ownership thing, but I think you may have even seen the article. Cruising World did an article probably, must have been about five, six years ago now, and looked at the average North, they surveyed, I think, 1,500 people that own boats in North America, boats between 36 and like 45 feet, and they found that the average person was spending eighteen to $24,000 a year on their boat, and then they asked them, they said, well, how many days are you getting out on the water? And the crazy thing was they found out that the average person who owned one of these boats was getting out on the water four days a year, right? And yeah. you think, oh my goodness, if you're spending $24,000 a year, that's four charters a year, you know, four week long charters go somewhere. And at the end of the week, you turn the keys in and you don't have to worry about it. And so right. I think you're right. There really is a beauty in chartering. Even for people that want to buy a boat, we highly encourage them. Charter a bunch of boats. They're all very different, right? Find one that yeah. you like. What do you look for? What is really meets, you know, your needs and criteria? And so, yeah, I, I think chartering is a great way to go. Yeah. Your last point about if you're thinking of buying one, go charter some. That's exactly what we did. Right. Okay. So we went because, you know, we had a 22 foot sailboat for, for many, many years. Okay. And it was, okay. We want to get a big one. And it was the chartering that sort of said, okay, this is an important feature. Yes. Of this, of, of this is something we want. This is something that's not important because yes. in your head, it's totally different when you first think about it than when you actually use it. So yes. when we got down to saying we're ready to pull the trigger and buy a boat, we had our, our list of five or six things that were must haves. Yes. And then that gets you to focus really quick. It does. It right? does. And yeah, and I think the neat thing, that list is going to be different for everyone, right, Bella? Like That's for right. you and I, and people don't realize that, but like we had friends, my wife and I, we did a six month sabbatical through the Caribbean. Our friends were on a Katana 42, a catamaran that was beautiful. This boat sails like a bat out of hell. It's gorgeous. Yes. There's two tiny compartments to keep your food in the salon, right? My wife was right. like, how on earth, where do they put everything, right? So it's a right. fast boat, but there's no storage. And so for everybody, for them, you know what? They wanted a fast boat. For us, right. it was that thing of we wanted a little more storage. And so you're right. For everybody, you got to find those criteria. And so chartering is a great way to get to your list. Yeah, it really is. It's a really great way to help you define that list and, and yeah. sort it out in your head. Uh, because buying a boat can be overwhelming. There's just... Yeah. So many boats, right? You say, okay, I want a boat between 40 and 45 feet. Well, there's hundreds of them and yes. they're all different. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Right? It's true. And, and so that's great. Uh, 
what other what other sort of things should people be thinking about if they if they're considering coming to to see you and and uh, go out on one of your week long trips? Um, you know, it is a big investment, Bella. Just by the time yeah. you pay for the course, you pay for you know all of the flights and all that thing. So you know, I, I think it's just it's good for people to come in with realistic expectations. And before you commit to a course like this, you know, even go do a day sailboat. Did you get? crazily seasick where, you know, it's not going to work for you. Um, right. You know, people, we often have people come in and they'll do the course and um, they'll, they'll say, wow, you know, it's not as luxurious as I thought. Right. And really at the end of the day, it's kind of glorified camping, right? You have limited water, you have, right. you know, you're in a small confined space. Um, you know, the boat may be moving, there may be other noises and things. And so I think coming into it with real realistic expectations makes a big difference. And so just, is this going to be for you evaluate, right? Apart from just the illusion of sipping a pina colada on a white sand beach, how are you going to do, you know, on right. passage for a couple of days? Um, how are you going to do with seasickness? How do you do in smaller spaces? How do you do with, you know, less water so that you're not doing 30 minute showers like at home, you know, all right. that kind of stuff. It's it's really a week of self-discovery, isn't it? It really is. And, you know, we love seeing it sometimes, Bella. I mean, we have we have students who at the end of the week are like, oh, my gosh, this has changed my life. I am going to go home. I've got a year plan now. I want to sell my business and sail around the world. This is confirmed. Right. I love this. And then right. we have other people like, you know what? We enjoyed it, but we're probably not going to be sailors. We think we'll go and stay at really nice hotels. We like the hotels. Right. And so that's fine, you know. And, and that's fine. And, and that's valuable for both of those people. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Extremely valuable for both of those individuals. Yeah. Right? No we matter young, what, no matter what the outcome is. Yeah. We had a young couple in Mallorca this past um, summer who did the course with us and fantastic. They had dreamed about buying a sailboat. And at the end of the week, they came to us and they said, you guys have done an amazing job. We love this week. It was an incredible adventure, but we realized we probably don't want to spend all of our time in a small confined space. And so we've kind of decided this is not for us. And hey, yeah. way better than we do occasionally get calls, Bella, from people like, I've decided I want to dive into the sailing thing. I just bought a $400,000 boat. I've never sailed. Teach me how to use it. And it's just right. that, you know, it is nice to test the waters first. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So uh, start wrapping this up. We've been chatting for 35 minutes. Uh, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you'd like to share with our listeners? Um, no, I think part of this is this is the first step. People, you know, often say, am I going to be an expert? Am I going to be a master sailor at the end of a week course? And we have to tell people, this is the first step on your journey. The reality is you're going to get the basics. You're going to get an amazing foundation, solid foundation, but then it's up to you to practice just like everything, right? When you get your driver's license, are you an expert driver? No, right? It takes experience practicing right, right. in different scenarios, different conditions, right. all of that. It's the same with sailing. So we really want to, you know, just encourage people that this is the start and then keep working at it. And so part of that for us, we have this amazing network of alumni, people who've done our courses. And every year we do six to eight flotillas around the world where, hey, they can come in, bring their friends, family. They charter a boat. They're on their own, but they follow a leader. We all have oh, a blast. Nice. Take them to the secret spot. So we do a lot of next step activities like that. You know, we also have students who want blue water um, offshore experience. And so we've now bought two different boats in Croatia that we've sailed all the way to Mexico or the Caribbean. Um, we're about to buy a third boat. And basically what that what that gives us is we break up into delivery legs and we have alumni come back. So we have alumni oh, do an wow. Atlantic crossing. We have alumni, yeah. you know, sail from to the Azores, sail through the Med. And so, again, I think it's neat to be able to just look ahead and think, OK, this will be the first step. But what's going to be kind of the steps I can take after that to gain experience, whether that's chartering or doing tr alumni training trips or things like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So l let me ask you another question. So uh, you talked a little bit about, you know, being a teacher, working in the corporate world, the downturn and, uh, and that kind of said, okay, we're going to do something else. Um, you know, what, when that downturn happened, you had a thousand different things you could have done, <laughs> right? It sounds like you live in a ski town. So, you know, you, you could have been a, a worked at a ski resort or something or being sure. a ski instructor. So, uh, what what was sort of the impetus for saying we're going to do this as our business and we're going to try to make a run at this? Yeah, we kind of had, you know, in 2008 when the economy crashed, I was uh, running an international um, nonprofit, working all over the world, traveled a lot, enjoyed my job. 
But uh, I think we had a chance when everything kind of stopped. It was like, hey, let's not rush into a job. Let's look at our lifestyle and what do we want? And I think, you know, even for the pan since the pandemic, a lot of people have been asking mm, this question. Yeah. So that yeah. for us, it was a little bit earlier. It was 2008. And we took a couple months off. We took four months off when I lost my job and we actually moved to Hawaii, um, spent some time with family and just kind of reevaluating. And during that time, we thought, you know what, let's do something that we love. And we loved sailing. We love traveling. And we both my wife and I love teaching. And so at that point, we kind of thought, well, it's kind of sounds crazy, but let's give this a shot. And really, if mm. things don't work out, I can always go back and get a job in international project management. But we wanted just to see if we could do the lifestyle. And it, it, it has been amazing. I mean, just the joy for, for us um, and for me, seeing people who this is life changing for them and they're taking sabbaticals and they're making yeah. changes yeah, and yeah. retiring early. There's something where I feel like I'm making a difference in people's lives and I get to share my passion, which I love sailing. I love my office. I mean, it's hard to beat my office, you know, yeah. sailing in beautiful oceans of the world. So to be able to share that with people, I love it. And so there's there's been zero regrets, Bella. Yeah, that's really great. I really like the way you kind of characterize that, right? You you sort of took an inventory of the things that you guys love to do. You made that list. And then you said, how in what in different areas can we do these things? Yeah. And sailing charters and, yep. and your your flavor of sailing charters. Yeah. Right. Sort of uh, gives you that opportunity. So that that's just that's just a great sort of statement about life as well. Right. So <laughs> True. take a yeah. look at the things that you really enjoy doing. And oftentimes you can put together a way to make a living doing those things. You don't have to be confined to sort of the normal, whatever normal means, uh, way of, of making making a living. It, honestly, I mean, if I had any advice, you know, apart from the sailing thing, that was a big, daunting, scary list, uh, you know, jump for us. Yeah. To make that move. And we even had family and friends like, what are you doing? You're crazy. <laughs> I mean, what kind of people yeah. start a sailing company in the middle of the a, a ski town, yeah. right? I mean, what do you, but honestly, it, it, you know, we, we, we did it anyway. And for us, it's been incredible. We absolutely love it. Yeah. The opportunities it's giving, given my wife, and my kids to travel and see places. And so for every, anybody, you know, I highly recommend if you're thinking about a big leap in life like that, something to pursue your passions, give it a shot. Worst case scenario, if it doesn't work out, you can always go back to what you did before. That's right. That's right. Well said. Well said. So if people want to find out more about Nautilus Sailing, uh, how's the best way for them to do that, Tim? Perfect. So the best thing is our website, which is www.nautilussailing. And people get confused because there's two S's in the mid middle there. There's the S from Nautilus and then the S for sailing. Uh, but that's the best way. And then from there, you can go to, you know, we're at NautilusSailing.com on Instagram, Facebook as well. Uh, but really, our website's a great place to start. There's actually some really cool, even free resources for people. We did a video series on, you know, best ways to moor and anchor. I think it's now got over a million views on YouTube. But, you know, that's a great free resource for people that are just you know, want to dabble in things. And if you want to learn more about our courses, it talks about all the destinations and everything on our website. Super. I will make sure uh, that information about your website is in the show notes. Hey, Tim, it's been really great. I really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, it was fascinating. Thank you very much for being a guest on the show. Bill, I really appreciate the opportunity. It was great just to hang out and uh, talk to you. And who knows, I hope our paths cross maybe on the water at some point. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. I really, really enjoy that. Thanks. Well, Bela, really interesting conversation with Tim. I really like the combination of somebody who is a passionate teacher and a passionate sailor um, coming up with a really a, a fairly radically different business model from the, the status quo, from the established kind of norms in the industry, from what I understand. And, you know, I know sailing schools have been around for a long time. There's kind of been a model and a, a prototype for success that people have imitated successfully, right, um, all around the world. Um, but, you know, to me, Tim showed that there's always room for innovation and it was built on his passions and his strengths, um, even when it's a mature market with lots of competition. Uh, what's your takeaway? Why do you think Tim was successful in this space um, with a lot of competition uh, already existing? Yeah, so Elaine and I took a one week long uh, sailing course, uh, an American Sailing Association course, uh, uh, 15, 20 years ago now, where we went for a week you know, similar to what Tim offers. Uh, we did it on the Chesapeake Bay. It was a great way to learn. And uh, it was really good. And I will say that our instructor uh, was exceptionally skilled at sailing and was a average teacher. Did a, did a good job, um, but did not, 
you know, understand the dynamics, I'll say, of teaching, the different way people learn. Uh, you know, some people learn by listening, some people learn by doing, some people learn by watching, and some people learn by some combination of those things. Uh, and it, it sort of reminded me of, you know, you and I having work in higher ed, you continue to work there. We've all seen people who are expert, deep experts in a particular field, and they're teaching a course, but they really have no teaching skills. And so this this has hap this happens in in all sorts of places. Uh, I've seen it in the corporate world as well. Uh, so I think Tim's approach is really was really good. He he's taking folks who who have teaching skills and they have sa sailing skills, so they can take a diverse group. Because one of the challenges here is you know it's it's like teaching freshmen at college. You get a pretty wide spectrum of of base skill levels of baseline. And, and that same thing can happen here. For example, when Elaine and I took the course, Elaine and I had 20 plus years of sailing experience on a small boat. And, and the person, the third person in the group was like you, had zero sailing experience. So, so the, there is a challenge for the instructor. You know, how do I keep both of these folks sort of focused and, 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 and learning? So I think that's, that's sort of really a, a neat thing that, that Tim does is, is that he's, he's getting people who are teachers or former teachers and using them uh, for, for this experience. Yeah, I, I think it's a really good point. And then I was interested in this other kind of a, a aspect of his business model too, where he doesn't own his own boats, right? He, mm. he essentially charters them and he doesn't have to worry about fixed costs and taking care of things uh, in storms and all the things that you do with your boat that we've heard all about. Um, he doesn't really have to worry about any of that. His his weekly running costs are a little higher, but then he doesn't have all the off season costs and the maintenance and stuff like that. Um, what's your sense on that? And I mean, how um, is that scalable? Is that something that you can do in the long run, or do you think it, there's some downsides to that strategy? I, I, I thought it was pretty clever, uh, to tell you the truth, because here's how our approach went. We wanted to take a week long sailing class. We wanted to get our certifications. I looked on the Chesapeake Bay and I, and that's the only place we looked because it was relatively close. We didn't want to fly, have to fly someplace. We could drive there. And I picked out a school on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and the Chesapeake Bay is a great place to sail. Um, and I think what Tim is doing <clears throat> is, is he's finding, I would say much more exotic locations. So, so locations that that some clientele would say, hey, you know what? I was thinking of going to Spain for a vacation. So let me combine two weeks trip to Spain. And then for one of those weeks, I'll take this sailing course. Um, so I think I think that part of it's really clever. Uh, so the, the sailing school typically has one location and that's where they run all of their classes. There's a sailing school at our marina, right? And they have that's the only place they run classes out of. Um, so this gives you, I think, a, a much sort of broader market swat without having to own boats in all these various different places. Uh, mm -hmm. And the notion of chartering boats, I think, is also great because you're getting relatively new boats. You, as the sailing school, don't have to worry about taking care of them, the maintenance on them, all of that stuff. Yeah, it's going to cost you a little bit more money, but I think in the end run, it saves you money. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's probably cheaper. And you don't have that headache, right? You get on the boat. And now, as he said, he's developed a relationship with with one of these charter companies. So, you know, that that sort of helps it along as well. So I'm sure he negotiates yep. a better price, et cetera. Absolutely. So, but then so those, I think those people that he's training are going back to charter with this company because they like the boats and they know like the location. Uh, I mean, it's a symbiotic relationship, you know? Exactly. Exactly. So like the sailing school at our marina has boats that are 20, 25, 30 years old. Right. And, and, and then they're great boats for teaching. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but you know, there's sexy. a marketing, there's a marketing angle here for the charter company as well. Exactly. It's not sexy, you know? Yeah. So, and I think there also is a benefit there with the way he recruits his instructors, right? So his instructors aren't limited to a, a city, right? Is they know that right. they'll get to fly out to this cool place and run a tour. And there's even some choices that they can have. I don't know if he keeps the same people in the same place or they mix it up a little bit. But if you're an instructor, that's kind of, I think, a neat little benefit that um, you're you're going to these cool places and you're sailing on great boats that are new. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why he's been able to attract and retain the instructors 
Um, you know, he talked about all right. that they're very high rated and things like that. Um, cause he's got something that's unique there as well. that can attract the, the talent side. So, you know, if you figure supply and demand, he's got the supply kind of some, an edge on the supply because he can offer these great locations. He's got the partner, so he doesn't have to invest in the assets. And then it's attractive to at least the demographic he's interested in the destination sailing, you know, slash vacation kind of thing. I'm yep. sure there's a whole group that just wants to make it simple and convenient and they live near an, a, an ocean or an inland waterway where there's a sailing school. It's a different market. Right? Um, right. Some of them might be interested, but, you know, if you li don't live near like you do, a, 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 you know, a body of water with a marina on it, you need something like this. You're going to stay in a hotel anyways and get there, you know. Right. So I think it's an interesting mix and interesting business model um, that at least from what I little I know about this industry kind of stood out a little bit as 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 innovative. Yeah, I think there are two points I want to make. Uh, one is I'm a big proponent of, of taking one of these. Uh, uh, sanctioned courses. So like American Sailing Association is like the biggest one around the world. So that way, when you've completed the course, you you sort of have your ticket that you could go charter a boat. So you can walk into most charter companies and tell them, look, I've taken ASA 104. And they say, okay, great. They're going to let you charter the boat. Um, because as as time goes on, these things are going to get more restrictive as opposed to less restrictive. So the notion of, of, you know, as opposed to just going to try to figure out how to do this on your own or going out with one of your buddies, that's great. But the notion of getting that certificate from a, from a, from a, a, a certifying organization like American sailing association or one of the other ones, I think is a really good thing. The other thing I'll say um, is that you have to figure out what works best for you, right? When Elaine and I took this week long course, I mean, it was intensive and we had, we had sailing skills. So we knew a fair amount of stuff and we still learned a ton. Um, but it was pretty intensive. So, you know, the, the seven day or the five day, boom, 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 living on the boat may not work for you. So there are other schools that offer things you do on a Saturday and a Sunday and, and it, it's multiple Saturdays and Sundays, right? But you can get the same certificate. So it's, it's not like you have to take a, one week long certificate to get your your charter ticket punch so to speak you can do it in in dribs and drabs uh so you got to figure out what works for you what works for your lifestyle and and so those opportunities out there but i do highly recommend that people go out and do this and and the instructors all of the ones that i run into are skilled they know what they're doing and and you'll learn a lot even as an experienced sailor elaine and i learned a ton of stuff Brilliant. As usual, the last word, Bela, was yours. I, I like that wrap up. Uh, I think listeners, let's wrap this up. And thanks again for joining us for another episode. Uh, we hope you found the conversation with Tim Geisler today interesting and thought provoking like we did. And if you have questions about what we've discussed, uh, as always, please feel free to get in touch with us. Our email is sailing the east. That's all one word at gmail.com. Hey, and if you enjoyed the podcast, hit that follow button on your favorite podcasting app. If you know of someone that would be a good guest for the show, let us know. We'd love to have them on. So hope to see you out there soon. So until next time, signing off from chilly and cold and snowy upstate New York. See you all soon. Thanks, Bela. And from over here in Münster, Germany, where it's not quite as cold as where you're at. And it's uh, quite frankly amazing that I can go to work and come home to work now in, in daylight. Uh, so we're making progress. Spring's coming soon. Uh, but signing off and see everybody next time.